All right. Hello, everyone. We are back to Fedora Week of Diversity. So from here, we're getting into the last part of our day for the schedule. Up next, we've got our really actually our last main session before closing remarks. But we are here to have the DEI in open source panel uh, with quite a few folks from both the Fedora community, but also uh, quite some wide range of experiences. Uh, and I'm really excited to have our group of panelists here together. So I'm going to go ahead and bring everyone up on stage. Uh, we have and Benny and Amita. Uh, and Adrian, I'm going to have to drop you because I think we are cat on our, on our list here. So. You. And all right. Hey, folks, how's everyone doing today? It's great to see some familiar faces here. Yeah, hi. I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's like a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening, like all in one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, I think honestly very fitting for for our week of diversity because we have folks from all over the world in the project. Yep. So I think Amita, I believe you are our chair for the panel. Mm -hmm. And I think are we waiting on anyone else still? Suchi. Yeah, she uh, is traveling, so she uh, told that she'll join in, or uh, maybe in some time, or so we can uh, get started with the folks we have, and uh, uh, then she will join in with us maybe later on. All right. Well, from here, I'm going to hand it all over to you, lovely people, to drive us through our last panel discussion for the day over to you all. Thank you, Justin. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining in. Uh, as Justin correctly said, that I think this panel represents the diversity really well, because we are from different places, different time zones, right? So without any further delay, let's stick into the introduction. So I would like to request everybody on the panel to please uh, introduce themselves to the audience. And especially if you can cover how you started in open source and your involvement in DEI, that will be really good. So let's start with uh, Dipisha. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dipisha Burse. Um, I recently uh, completed my bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, I live in Pune, India. And I started my open source journey, I think, in my second year. And then I slowly got involved in different communities, different projects, and eventually I started contributing to GNOME. So currently I am the I'm leading the DEI initiative at GNOME. And um, yeah, I'm also a part of the organizing committee there. So yeah, that, that's my introduction. Thank you so much. Benny, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. I'm uh, Benny, obviously. I got started in open source because I worked at a web hosting control panel called cPanel that uh, relied heavily on open source. And we believed strongly in giving back to the open source community. So I got to interact with folks a lot there. And then I worked for a company called Chef for a while <clears throat> that taught me a lot more about what it is to be part of an open source project that has a large community. And uh, through through a number of things, ended up at Alma Linux, and I'm uh, I'm excited to be part of this. From the the DEI perspective, I have worked really hard to um, make. I mean, the current day, I work really hard to make Alma Linux a welcoming community. And other than that, it's a lot of reminding folks that just because you have your own perspective doesn't mean that it's the same perspective everybody has. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, just one uh, thing I want, want to noti notify to Justin, if you are hearing, I just uh, got a message from Shuchi that she was trying to join in the Google Meet link uh, and I shared this link with her just now. So please uh, keep a watch if she joins in, put her on the stage. Thank you so much. Um, thanks again, Benny, for your introduction and uh, welcome, Shuchi. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, Vipul, 
would you like to go ahead and uh, give an introduction? Absolutely, not really a stranger to the community. Uh, I'm Vipul. I work as open source innovation specialist at UNICEF. And my work lately have been, the well, base of it is helping understand the innovators that are often overlooked, the power of open source and how they can use it and make their solution truly robust and scalable to reach the people unreachable from general technology world today. Uh, I also work with a lot of digital public goods to help them understand what open source is and how can you make there's open source there's open source done right uh, how can you make a project which is reaching everyone and dei is core of that i started as a user then contributing to fedora project and specifically the dei part of along with a lot more but dei part i have learned and grown in fedora project where i learned from Amita, you on the screen that i see i have learned a lot from you justin yona marie there are many people who have taught me how to understand what you bring, what your the privileges that you need to understand, and also how can you counter that, but at the same time, the unique voice that you have. And if I can feel that my voice is nothing unique, then there are a lot of other people can feel that as well. So how do we create a safe space? I also was uh, the diversity advisor to Federal Council for a little while, uh, but yeah, now I constantly, the solutions that we build, uh, we look at many different angles on how can we build solutions for communities that we think we are building for, but how do we include them into it? So my DEI is not about recently, at least not about project contributor, but thinking how can we make sure the tools are developed for children, which is very relevant to UNSF uh, or people who do not have internet connections. How do we reach this? If we are building a financial inclusive tool, how do we make sure it works without internet? So people who do not even have smartphones can use it. So diversity, equity, inclusion is core of what UNICEF should be doing and or what we are doing. So that's my journey and involvement in the EI. That is an awesome introduction, Vipul. And I'm so, so excited that we have people from UNICEF, NOM, Fedora, and whatnot. And I would like to welcome Shuchi as well, who, are, who is from Red Hat and the DEI advisor uh, in, in Red Hat. Uh, so, Shuji, if you can take a few minutes and please uh, introduce yourself to our audience, that would be really good. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Amita and Vipul, for the introduction and warm welcome. Uh, my Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Shuchi Sharma. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, um, I am wearing a black jacket and pink top, and I have uh, black brownish hair. And I am delighted to be here with all of you today. I serve as the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Red Hat Software. Uh, I've been working for about uh, probably most of my career in technology and have done a variety of things across the technology space in consulting, um, strategy, sales, you name it, and spent probably about the last eight years uh, working in the DEI space on the strategic transformation of organizations to really advance women and underrepresented groups and minorities. And it has been an incredible journey. Um, this work is incredibly important for organizations in terms of maintaining competitive advantage and innovation, um, and also like for creating fair and equal access to opportunities for all. And that is what really motivates me, not only because of my own life journey, but the potential that I know is untapped in our population uh, that is so important for us to bring to the fore in all of our organizations and companies and think help us think about how do we create a more inclusive society for all to Vipul's earlier point. So thank you for having me. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in the open source communities. But I am delighted to be here as a listener and observer today and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Ruchit. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. And I cannot agree uh, more. And we all know this point by now that how critical it is to have the DEI representation and the groups in all the organization, whether it is open source or not. So. My first question to the panel is I mean, that, yeah. I think we have one panelist not introduced here. Oh, no, sorry, you started with it. I'm sorry. 
Okay. Uh, so my question is that what are the common challenges when we try to establish uh, such DEI working group in our communities? Uh, what are the common challenges we face uh, to implement these kind of initiatives in, a, in any organization? And specifically, if we can focus in open source communities. Uh, Vipul, would you like to address this? Yeah, so again, uh, I could answer from open source perspective, but I'll answer what is very relevant to me. And one of the things, the biggest challenge is when it comes to resources, building good solutions or accessible solution and doing more work in DEI requires resources. And it's very important that governance structure realizes that there must be some resource allocated for either be it capacity building or be it providing your community with uh, resources. And that can be from actual devices to connectivity to a platform to talk and it can go anywhere. But also one very unique that I see is acknowledging and doing something to go beyond your survivorship bias. One of the examples I would say a challenge could be, let's take this example of stream. Does this streaming solution work for you? And probably all of you will answer yes. But the thing is, for those who it didn't work, they're just not here. So how do, do we look beyond our common understanding of the project and try to get insight from people who are not in this space? Only then we can identify those critical points which is not very visible. So that's something unique. I don't know. It's not easy uh, when we want to do survey for Linux, unless opening it for everyone, you know, it's, there's no other way. If it was just for Fedora specific, you can put it on discussion.fp.o and probably a lot of community will answer. But how do you go beyond? How do you go beyond and target those specific members who could be there? Challenge? Uh, hopefully someone will answer and fix a solution here. Yeah. Uh, Dipesha and Benny, would you like to contribute? Uh, to what Vipul has said and what are your thoughts around it? What are those challenges in establishing such kind of groups in our open source communities? Yeah. Um, I think adding on to what uh, Vipul said, I, I completely second that. Um, again, measuring these things is also something that I've seen a lot of issues with. Like when Vipul says, okay, you know, we're not reaching a certain, you know, you know, we're not reaching certain people. How do you measure that, you know, okay, things are changing or they're not changing. And how do we know how much impact it's, it's hard to, you know, really measure it. So I think, um, while the first step is finding the solution, the next would be like, how do you move forward with it? Right. So, uh, that is something that, um, I'm still trying to figure out for Noam, like we're having discussions on like measuring how to, you know, measuring the impact that we're having, what changes are we making? So I, I think that was something that. Dipisha, let, let me ask you a question because, and yeah. the, I mean, the communities is my understanding don't always have like, it's a, probably a more fluid structure in terms of membership, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. there's, there's no sort of official um, count of individuals involved. You can take it a snapshot at a given point in time, yeah. um, but it's difficult because they're so dynamic, correct? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you can look at tr maybe trends over time in terms of representation. Mm -hmm. And if you take those snapshots, you can see like, is it is it evolving? Is it changing? Yeah. Uh, in the way that we want it to, even though you don't have a standard number that yeah. you can consistently measure by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yet that does require some level of analytics and tools mm -hmm. in order to see. So, and representation in this open source communities is so, it's so important, but I agree, like it's a challenge, right? How do you, how do you consistently measure your representation in the community structure? And I mean, you all are more well-versed. I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are there. Well, and even a step beyond that, it's hard to, measure how effective the community that you have is which i think is, is what you were talking about the like the work that you're doing how do you decide whether or not it's worth it how do you decide where to put your efforts right that can be really hard too um one of the other things that i see as a problem especially in like deep um like not deep, but the the kind of uh, programmers that I interact with regularly is getting buy-in on the importance of 
uh, accessibility in software, right? Mm. Like the, if we just go at the base level, getting that, the acceptance of, no, we, we really do have to do this. This matters. It's important. You have to pay attention to it. That's how I ended up. Uh, I think that's how I ended up here, right? The, the idea that if there's something that is broken, there's only, you can, going back to the earlier statement, you can only really hear from the people after they've shown up. If you are excluding a whole group of people for uh, intentionally or unintentionally, they're not going, it's not their job necessarily to be loud about it, right? There's a, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit calling out Fedora right now, but there's a, there's a bug that I'm sure we all know about that's in Fedora 40 that is making it so screen readers can't get past the, the like opening or the install. And they, like, there's one person who has been kind of loud about it, who, uh, shouldn't have to be the person that's loud, right? That we should have caught it. We should have all of that kind of stuff. Like it's, we, it's been identified and they're working on it and all of that kind of stuff. But the, the lack of buy-in from like of importance put on that kind of testing early on can cause problems everywhere. And if you don't have somebody in your community that represents that group, you're never going to hear about it. Like we would not have heard about that bug, right? if they hadn't been testing it. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Benny, because that to me is like one of the biggest ways that communities can have impact around inclus inclusion is through the accessibility. Yep. And so, you know, for example, at Red Hat, we have uh, a group that is really focused around digital accessibility and our, our accessibility and our product development, but you're absolutely right. How do we extend that into our communities from farther upstream so that it it it's easier and it's already you know it needs to start at the design phase um and oftentimes i think it's also like a there's a level of education people just don't have because of their own life experience right we lived in we live in a very ableist society all around the world and so it's not natural for people to think about accessibility needs. But once they understand the value and the importance of it um, through awareness and education, oftentimes they'll come around to say, OK, well, this really is important. And you know, so many people are touched by visible and invisible disabilities, and that population will only continue to grow. So it's something that's definitely on our radar at Red Hat. And we have a, an accessibility leader in our company who works um, very closely for me with me, but it, it even it's it's cross enterprise, right? Like we have to be thinking about this at all levels of our organization, and, and that might be one of the areas where we need to think about how do, how do we get our communities, open source communities, to really focus around accessibility and make that the priority, right? Well, absolutely, Shuchi, and coming back, looping it back again to what we started is with the resources. Uh, so we have very limited, uh, currently limited uh, resources to and people to work on, uh, you know, the testing part of the uh, Fedora. And we are glad that we have people helping us uh, raising that kind of issues and we are giving it attention, if not sooner than later. I know the bug cost more than it is found after the release or the production. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking that if should we, we can later uh, think of having help of uh, this accessible accessibility group in within Red Hat to guide our uh, community engineers uh, somehow to, uh, to see that what is their strategy and plan of action or the test plan, how they do the testing and invest themselves in this kind of testing. So that angle, if we can work out, maybe that can be helpful for uh, Fedora and other communities as well. There's actually a whole thing going on right now about the, the accessibility testing in Fedora. There's a, like a whole week about it 
Um, yeah, just so we'll probably drop a link to it. The accessibility testing week that started a few days ago and it goes for another, I think, four days. Um, that's exactly that. It's trying to get people rallied around this this need, right? It's kind of exciting to me. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, moving uh, to the next one, which I think relates to very much related to this previous discussion we are having is the role of local communities because accessibility can also be very diverse depending on the lo local groups, right? Uh, so how exactly uh, we motivate or ensure to have these local communities uh, in a, who can represent us globally and also bring out that diversity in a global community. So how we can fuel and uh, what exactly the role of these local communities in, in the global community like Fedora. So uh, Dipisha, would you like to pick this up and get us going? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think the biggest, uh, I mean, thing that we can really do to motivate uh, people would be to acknowledge them, give them the recognition. Uh, we saw that, uh, especially after Nomatia, which happened in um, Nepal this uh, 2023. So now we have a Nome Nepal community, right? So, um, you know, whether it's funding or whether it's giving them, you know, even like small shout out on like social media platforms or anything like that. So when people feel seen or heard, they feel more empowered and they will want to contribute more or be a part of it more or, you know, maybe like help you out with accessibility. Like you said, accessibility can, you know, mean a wide range of things. So I think um, for me, what I've noticed is acknowledgement and recognition really you know, goes a long way. So, yeah. Ripple, what do you think? So UNICEF also maintains like the local communities all around the world. They yes, UNICEF is a little bit too big and diverse and the way different organizations and departments within UNICEF work is uh, different ways. Uh, but one thing, Local communities can definitely help to identify those overlooked aspects of project development that is considered or that people who might not, who are not going to use the product, if they are going to develop it, there will always be a thing that you can't consider. For example, age, geography, relevance, culture and religion context, right? Education and literacy. If I'm developing a solution for India and it's in English, there are many questions that I need to think is internet fast enough for them to access this video? Should there be another way of delivering this kind of resources if you want to? Uh, and uh, I'll base my answer on uh, what Suchi mentioned that you need to have different stages of understanding with your product. And again, for Fedora project, it's a mature project and for it, it will look a bit different, but you need to start with design and ideate phase. Then you go to prototype and then you go to build and then you go to feedback and marketing. And when you are ideating it, you need to understand or ask questions. Are you centering community based organizations in order to validate your assumption about what the community need? Do they even want this kind of solution? Or if you are building a solution, what ha what happens if it's, it, uh, it has a facial recognition feature? Will it work with women wearing hijab? Uh, how is it a fun? not just accessibility check mark but it's fun to use for people with disabilities and having local people they can actually validate these things that yeah this is actually happening in in as the result of it so that feedback uh, that giving people space uh, to show exactly what they need and if they can use it or not is very important and we need to approach it at different stages of project so the survey will look very different on what stage of the project you are building at yeah that's what definitely i'm i'm sure uh Shuji, you you must have a very um pioneered and experienced answer to pol much more polished uh as you maintain these local communities in at an enterprise level so my question is a little different for you i would like to know uh from your experience, an example, if you can share with us, that most fascinating example 
of having these local community, uh, the impact on DEI. Can you share any example like, okay, we have people in Singapore and this is what came up from there, which was very fascinating. I think that's the beauty of working in a global organization, right? And, you know, one of the things that is part of my um, really aspirations for Red Hat, right, as, as we grow as an organization is that we become, you know, really more global in our mindset and how we work together. But that, that global mindset requires us to be very connected to our local communities outside of the U.S. And so, for example, you know, if you look at things that are there, there could be initiatives happening in India that we want to pull into our global strategy, right, and cascade all over the world. Um, we also have to make sure that we're listening to different communities around what their needs are, right, and understand that we can have a global structure, but we also have to have regional plans that are adopted for the needs of those communities, because, you know, for example, what a woman needs in India may be very different in terms of support than what a woman in South Korea might require, for example, to be successful, right? Um, you know, I think we all know very, very much like there's a strong identity in India of being a daughter, right? And this is really important for us to consider, but it's not an identity or persona we may consider in how we shape our um, systems, processes, and programming in the US. So it's important to have that cultural understanding, but also understand, well, what can we learn from this persona and, and, and how we're supporting our associates in this country and how do we bring that into our global strategy uh, where possible? So, you know, and we also have examples where our communities have impacted, created impact in the community around them. Ultimately, we want to represent the communities we serve, right? We want to look like them. We want to understand them because there's, that's where our customer bases are as well. And if we don't represent our customers, how do we create products for them? It goes also back to accessibility, right? The needs around accessibility are only going to increase going forward. We know this. Um, so we have to be thinking about how we design our products to meet those needs, but also how we decide, design our systems, our experiences for our associates as well as their demographics are changing, right? This, the younger generation of which you all are a part of, generation, you know, it comes after mine, which is Z or millennials, very different needs, very different expectations, right? It's important to be thinking about how do we listen to those generations and incorporate what they, are expecting and need and want in an organization as well. Wow, that's so impressive. Uh, the knowledge you all carry around DEI, I think this is incredible. And this, uh, with that, I, I would like to go to my next question that so many thoughts, so many efforts we are putting into bringing in these diverse people and being inclusive in our communities in, at our enterprise level, local and globally. But at the same time, how do we measure that, where we stand with these efforts? Is, is there any metrics in place for DEI which can measure all of these things? And is there one tool? If not, then what it should be? What should be the right solution to measure all of these things that we are doing good, at least we are doing, we are getting better to keep track of it? what it can be and i would like to start with them sure yeah it's one of those things that we always fight against right measuring because you end up uh asking people to surrender knowledge that they or information about themselves that they might not feel comfortable surrendering and that's always the first hurdle especially in a uh, technical community. There's a lot of privacy concerns that people have, whether it's because in, they want control over their information in general, or because they're worried that that information will be used against them in some way, right? There's always that concern. That's the first hurdle that we have to get over. And I struggle to find an ethical way to balance those things. Typically, if you rely on something that's self-reported, which is what we should be doing, you're going to get skewed data. You can get 
if you get a good sample size, then it will, can be good enough. But without a, a pretty significant sample size, it's hard to really know what's true and what's not. So then if you look for something that's not self-reported, then you're starting to, to get into an area where you're violating the, the like the un understood agreement between you and your community, right? And that makes it so hard to accurately measure what you've got in terms of diversity and what uh, therefore measure the effectiveness of anything you're doing, right? And question, Benny, is that because when you join a community, you uh, you don't necessarily like you don't necessarily commit for a certain length of time, and you don't you don't commit your information, your personal identif identifying information, even your name, your address, your birthday. Yeah. You're not committing yeah. anything, right? You're, like you're only you're contributing. Right? Very rarely, if you even if you just are joining a chat room, you're not using your real name. You're using your handle you're using one you made up for this chat room like whatever right. that, and that means that it's almost impossible to directly uh, equate this username that is contributing however much they are whether it's a lot or not very much and anything that would track along uh what we would consider information that we can use as to track diversity right it's so hard and and what is the perception, if I may just ask a question to all of you while I'm, I'm so fortunate to have, like be within this group of people. Um, and Amita, please just tell me if there's no time. I, I don't, I won't ask the question. No, but no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. The, the question really is like, how do you see the experience of, the experience of women, let's, let's just take women for an example, contributors to the communities. You know, is there a experience where there's a difference, for example, in in time, in terms of how how long it takes to get their pull requests addressed? Is there a difference in like how their code is being addressed? What is the general perception? While I know it can't has not been quantitatively measured. Um, I, in GNOME, at least, all of the GNOME projects, I have really not seen much difference, which is really positive, and that's good. So I have not personally seen any difference uh, till date. I think even how people address each other, even in the chat rooms, or um, even when we're helping each other out with, you know, a PR, like you said, uh, I personally have not seen any difference. So, yeah. Okay, good. Good point. I'm not qualified to answer this. Uh, <laughs> tough to observe from my angle, but I think it was uh, Linux uh, Foundation which had a course on open source, and they mentioned that there is a massive amount of difference of how pull requests are criticized or right. how much they take to be accepted. So that mm -hmm. definitely exists, uh, and measuring it is tough. And that's why I also feel about metrics in general that they can be very quantitative and not qualitative yeah. and uh, we all know this but the thing is numbers can be gamed if we are just trying to look at numbers and grow it for us uh, from my perspective of uh, frontier technology team at unicef where we try to look at new technology and see how we can scale it or adapt it to help children what has worked is a good framework where we can ask those critical questions that are relevant to us so even if there is a metrics for one solution, it will be totally different depending on what community or what kind of, uh, if either it's a water and sanitization problem, then there's a different kind of question you need to ask. But if it's a disaster mapping, that's important, immediate need, first 12 hours of any disaster is the most important. So the question you ask is very different. And those are very on point to uh, reach certain uh, perspectives. So yeah, I, I don't have you made you made a good point. I I also wanted to tell the same thing. I there was I think there was a blog post as well from one of the female contributor telling that till the time my username was very neutral, my peers were getting worse very easily. But then the moment I attached a face to my username, it got difficult. So mm -hmm. yeah, with uh, with that, I would like to move to our uh, next one is how to you all think that can right and diverse talent can be attracted uh, to the communities and to organizations as Garishji 
and how we can re retain this diverse talent or diverse skills. Vipul, I think you qualify to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously we have best practices of a community that allows a good experience for anyone to onboard. Uh, but I think there is an aspect of resource allocation and sustainability to it uh, about retaining contributor, even inviting people. I remember US uh, aid had a Women Connect. I think this it still might be around a Women Connect initiative and humanitarian open street map used that to empower women and girls to create gender data. And uh, when they realized that it was so different from context, some places, uh, the access to childcare or access to hospitals, that kind of information started popping more. But at certain places, uh, they noticed uh, which are the bus stops that are well lit for security for, for women. Uh, so one of the way to invite diverse community is by allowing them, providing them certain value and creating that incentive to participate and realizing that's a very important voice. Uh, community is built by these individual people and individual communities uh, by itself in subversions and showing that's important is very good step, a very important step. So there's always that resources constraints in, in these things. What would it take for Fedora project to have an in-person event in West Africa where people don't have electricity or computer or uh, Linux. How do you go and empower that by going there and talking to people and providing them those things? So depending on how do you consider what element of uh, this wide spectrum do you consider the underrepresented in your community and the specific need, it will be a bit different. Absolutely, that that's a very strong message. Then, what 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 your what is your take on that? So the, I honestly think I want to hear what from Depisha about this because knowing that the known community has felt really welcoming to you, I think the known community is going to be the like experts at least here, right? I'd love to hear how you guys are making the safe or the the space feel safe, and how you are are making sure that as folks come in, they're they're met with the right people so that they want to stick around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, there are two parts that I wanted to really talk about. You know, when we talk about this, so the first part was attracting diverse contributors. Right. What I've noticed is like i think people also mentioned you need to have some incentive right um nobody will join without purpose you need to give them that reason but the minute that you give them that reason and they do um feel welcome or they do feel honestly just if you feel good right you're gonna come again the first step is just bringing them there and then it's all about the culture you know that that you know that person is in so um I, I think uh, that's definitely something which is very unique to know, and I really loved it, which is their code of conduct is like, um, they have been able to control that really well, like it's very defined or the code of conduct is, they're very strict about it. So, so that, you know, everybody's addressed properly, they're talked to properly, everyone feels wanted or heard, right? Um, also, I think it's about you have, I, I don't know how else to explain this, but if you have one good person, you're gonna attract better people or nice nice people, right? It, it builds a nice community. So I think Gnome has been able to sustain that nice community for a very long time. We've had contributors like, you know, contributing since 19, you know, whatever, 97, 2002, you know. Um, so especially when we create this, um, link or this connect between these contributors and even the new ones then you know they're ready to give that helping hand so people feel like staying because then you're even learning something right so um i think that's why i stayed i've been in the known community since jan last year and i have not once felt negatively about you know anybody which is a, you know it's a big thing so to say so uh yeah i think that's that's what uh known focus on <laughs> 
the Pesha, you have articulated it so well. Every point you were saying, I had a very big smile on my face just by thinking that, okay, this also exists in Fedora. This also we do in Fedora. This also we do in Fedora. So, okay, we are also doing a very good job. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. I have been in Fedora community for the last 10 years. Yeah. And I would put, add just one more point to that mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. the friend aspect which oh, we yeah. put uh, mm -hmm. in front. And I think the reason for me being in Fedora for such a long period of time is one of that major factor is for yes. so every contributor, every person in Fedora or Fedora, Fedora community. I think yeah. if we respect each other, that respect yeah. factor as a friend, that yeah. is the biggest motivation to stay, especially for the female member or the underrepresented groups. And one of the feedback which I also heard is that when you explicitly mention that this space is safe for everyone from the underrepresented group, whether it is female, whether it is the person with the whatever background, how your identity is, she, he, or whatever it is they are yeah. equally treated. If you yes. mention it in your code of conduct very clearly, it is in itself is more than enough. I mean, that is that is the point where you start being welcoming it and yeah. explicit about it. So very proud of it that we have these uh, communities existing in, to where we all can contribute equally. Definitely. With that, yeah, with that, I would like to move to the next one, um, how can attendees take actionable steps to promote uh, who are uh, our audience and everybody in the panel that what are the actionable steps we can take to promote and advocate for DEI in our own spaces or the projects or the work groups? Like, what are the biggest takeaways for everybody in here? If you can give one top takeaway for our audience. So starting with Shuchi. Sorry, Amita, you were cutting out a little bit. Let me make sure I heard the question right. You were asking, okay. what are the biggest takeaways the for promoting step. diversity in our open the source community? Yes, right. I, I think Dipisha uh, answered it so well, and Amita, you confirmed, right? Like starting from a place of inclusion, having those code of conducts in, in place is such a simple, actionable step a community can take to lay the foundation of what behavior is expected. And then creating, modeling the behavior on a regular basis, but also recognizing others who model that behavior and recognizing them for it to create um, role models and norms and expectations in the communities of how we behave. And then I think in terms of thinking about impact, right? Like where can the communities have the most impact as they're developing code is, is really, I think also around accessibility, right? Ensuring that we make our code as inclusive as possible for everyone is something that will be so impactful for so many organizations and and the world at large i mean if you think about the ripple effects of the potential impact of just doing that it's it's incredible absolutely huge plus one to that <laughs> benny would you like to add something in here yeah the the thing that it let's say that you are just getting started and just um, interested in your uh, in in how you can impact DEI in a community. The thing you need to start with is educating yourself. There's a book I was trying to look up the name of the book. I'll, I'll find it and I'll drop it in the chat later. Um, there's a book that I read that was kind of aimed at business people uh, and like understanding how different cultures interact around different things, but it has been so critical for me and my understanding because it's really like that, that kind of understanding is, is 
this book specifically covers like cultural differences about like how people interact with authority figures and how uh, conversations happen from a like, is this disagreement? Is this fighting? Is this um, just discussion? And like how people approach each other in each, each culture. When you're dealing with a global community, you have to understand those sorts of things, right? And uh, so yeah, start with education, find, find resources that get you the base level understanding that you need. And if once you start there, it, the world opens up. I think the book might be The Culture Map by Erin Mayer. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank Great. you. I highly recommend that. And it has yeah. helped me. Uh, also, I just want to echo what Deepisa said. Enforcement of uh, your community uh, uh, COC is very important. But also as individual contributor, I think it's important you try to map your own values to the COC in place. Because often it's not just the text that's in the it sits on COC guideline, right? You need to read and relate and how does my own value reflect to that? And that can help you understand why this is in place, right? So understanding from your perspective, from your own language, instead of just what the, what being respectful mean for you and your, your local understanding, instead of just the document is very important. And if you're building a solution, asking that question, who might not be able to use this solution? Who is it excluding? Not if I'm including anyone, just asking that specific question that might call out certain group that might not be included in that is very helpful. So understanding the different uh, stages, you can ask different questions to make your solution more accessible uh, to what Suki was saying is very important. Absolutely, Vipul, and that takes me to my next uh, question about code of conduct. How we make sure that we added the all the crucial and important elements into our code of conduct and further how we can make sure that um, we are implying it to its full potential so these are the two parts of question about the code of conduct uh Shuji, would you like to give your thoughts about it how it works in the organization structure. Uh, I think that is much more uh, professional way in uh, rather than, than compared to the open source communities and we can see the difference in a minute. Um, sorry, Amita, the, my uh, computer is giving me some problems, but I think you were asking about the code of conduct Conduct, and what, conduct two part how question. can communities how we can how we can implement it uh, to its full potential and what critical elements it should contain okay i'm so sorry, sorry. Then i'm having pick it up oh. and then we can come back to shuji uh, yeah sorry it's, it's okay no problem out. Uh, shuji we will come back yeah, we'll circle back to you, uh, Benny, if you can start. Sure. Yeah. So the importance of a code of conduct cannot be overstated. Uh -huh. It is the place where you define how your community is going to interact with each other. It's the place where you set up and uh, state very clearly the most important things that are going to happen in your community, right? If your code of conduct is mostly about how uh, uh how prs are reviewed or the timelines that are used or like that kind of stuff then that's very clearly where your focus is if your code of conduct is mostly about respecting each other and how interactions will take place and that kind of stuff it's it's that's going to set the tone of your community overall <coughs> is super important the patient yeah. Um, I think, uh, like I said, the GNOME code of conduct is very, you know, specific about everything. Um, as for enforcing it, I think what we have seen, what we usually do in conferences is we do share the code of conduct usually through email multiple times before the event. But even at the event, you know, we inform people and we also take a different session with the volunteers where we just, you know, run them by the code of conduct. 
and we tell them how to handle the situation if somebody is uncomfortable so you know okay you know maintaining privacy you know taking them aside talking to them making them feel comfortable telling them that you know we'll work on it and you know we'll make them whatever it is we'll take the action you know whatever needs to be taken so i think that was that's something that really works for us so um yes i mean it needs to be specific but also you know training people to handle situations if something does happen and making sure that the action is taken whenever it's needed so yeah that is a very beautiful point and a strong point as well and i think that takes a lot of energy to keep track of even if what has been reported is it legit or not so going through these reports issues and figuring that out and then being unbiased and then according to code of conduct taking an action i think it is yeah. it takes a lot of energy and thoughtfulness uh Vipul, what, what do you have to say about it no absolutely the enforcement is the key and there are a couple of things i would like to call out uh making sure that there is a diverse and local uh, coc contact person, representative, someone who can help understand is very important. So in case you have problem with someone who is in the COC committee, then what happens, right? Uh, how do you make sure that you are empowered enough to talk about that as well? Uh, another thing that Fedora has done really well, or uh, Justin, who is a big supporter of these things, is how do you have internal enforcement strategy? Yes, there is a code of conduct and there is all the things of reporting structure, but how do you internally handle it? that standard operating procedure for all of your COC members to follow. And the last one that I have seen in some places is providing some sort of incentive and extra support to the people in COC committee. It can be very mentally exhausting. If, if you have gone through some COC tickets, you know what it takes. And how do you make sure that it's more than just here's, the, here's a person in COC committee? So providing them extra resources so, so that they can equip themselves, they have better mental capacity to do this, providing them some sort of ease. And that can be from financial help to also, you can have this therapy support that we, we provide because you have been doing such important steps and making sure it's not impacting your personal understanding of things. So, uh, those are very important. So internal understanding of how you see COC, how you're gonna act, uh, provide action to it, but supporting the staff who have been doing it. That's so so important and critical. It's uh, that 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 point uh, stood out for me that having the support for the for the group which is supporting and promoting the and implementing the code of conduct in the community. It's uh, it's really very strong and uh, a powerful message. I think the takeaway, the biggest takeaway. Uh, Shuchi, can you hear me now clearly? Okay, I think there is some trouble and with that I can move to our next question which is how can leadership and mentorship programs I'm sure we all have that kind of programs in our community and in our space they can be better structured okay. to support under sorry Amika groups in open source. sorry I think I my computer has slowed to a crawl for some reason it's hard to hear but I, I think that uh no, everybody's given such beautiful answers here. I would only just echo just having that code of conduct and ensuring that we role model, implement the bit, you know, have a way to actually enforce it, right? It's really important. If you don't have a way to enforce uh, community participation or non-participation based on that, then um, it doesn't really do anything. That's, that's important, of course. Otherwise, just it's just another piece of paper, right? If we are not working right. towards implementing it or not following I mean, that, there has to be sort of a governance mechanism, and it sounds like there is. Um, to, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, do you get any financial extra financial support, Shuchi, to take care of, like people said? So, people mentioned that the people who are helping to implement these code of conduct they go through a lot of mental pressure as well because this is a mentally exhausting job and he suggests that they should get some extra benefits like therapies or financial so do you get that I, i'm just joking you don't have to answer that question <laughs> but you can acknowledge the fact no. that it's this no, I, a, I, 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 a I like job. You know, we, 
in doing doing this work in DEI, as you mentioned, this is some of the hardest work I've ever done. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'll repeat my uh, last question. We are moving to the next one. Is how can leadership and mentorship programs be structured to better support DEI or underrepresented groups in open source? How important these uh, structures or these work groups are for mentorship and leadership? Anybody would like to, I don't want to put anybody into support. Now, I think by this time, we all are comfortable speaking and yeah. uh, we all feel included, right? Yeah. So please go ahead, somebody pick it up. I think it's the same, uh, it, the answer is kind of the same thing that we've been talking about the whole time, right? You start, you, you approach it with the same intention that you would anything else you're working on. Look at it uh, with as many eyes and different perspectives as you can and accept the feedback that you get as important. Whether it, and sometimes we, we can get in our feelings, right? We, we, we make a decision. We, we're very proud of something that we've put together. And then somebody comes behind you and says, mm, this, is, this, this doesn't actually feel nice for me. This, this is a problem for me. And it can take a lot to, to kind of put your ego aside and, <laughs> and accept that feedback. So it's that kind of stuff. Like whatever uh, feedback you get and, and, and accommodate for it and then make part of your process reviewing it as you go forward. Because we're always learning new things. We're always learning new, uh, new biases that we didn't realize we had before, even if it's just in the community, like learn and continue to, to improve the, the structure as it exists. Yeah, just be open to change, as Benny said. <laughs> yeah. open to change and understand. I think this is for every aspect of life, but importance has already been enforced many number of times in this conversation. Mm -hmm. but having a feedback on your feedback mechanism is also very important and how you're going to adapt to that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Norm specifically, I think they also have an internship committee. So where we also work on, so we also, we have mentors usually in the internship committee, and we also have a few other people who usually have already done the internship under these mentors in the past. So we have that point of view too. And then, you know, based on whatever discussions happen, if any changes required, we can, we can make changes. So I think that's something that, uh, I really like personally uh, in Gnome, so yeah. Amazing. Uh, moving to the next one, and I'm going to answer that first because I'm very excited <laughs> looking at that question. It's about, can you share some success stories or example of the EI initiative that had a significant positive impact on your community? So I would, I would start with my personal story that 10 years back, approximately 10 years back, it was my first Fedora flock which I attended. I, and I was, of course, 10 years, my 10 years younger was much more colorful than these gray, gray and black here. So first conference, I think almost first time I was facing the stage and proud and very excited, very colorful dresses and everything. But I could see that it, a lot of engine like strong headed engineers <laughs> like very formal very uh, focused to the technology and i could not blend in properly but then i found somebody exactly like me i don't want to name her but i think she must be present and she can uh, ping in the chat if she want me to take her name because of her i felt so confident because I had somebody similar to me as a first time attendee of the flock, very colorful, bright mind, not from very technical background into, into design and everything. And because of her, I got so a lot of confidence to stay in the community. And that is exactly why later on, uh, we started with Fedora Women Day where we in, used to invite a lot of women, girls, used to visit the girls' colleges and everything. So, because 
it is so important to showcase that these underrepresented groups are there. They exist in smaller numbers. But at the same time, if you, uh, you can invite, you can present them out there to support the other people to bring in the community, it helps a lot. So I think the Fedora Women's Day stood out for me specifically as an initiative, which I wanted to share with all of you. And with that, uh, Shuchi, if you, you would like to, or Benny, anybody, I, I don't need to pick now <laughs> any name. So please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but can I just say one thing? Yeah, the Fedora project is really that example because it has surpassed being a code of conduct file or, or a policy. It has become a mindset of a lot of community members. And that is the success we wish to see where it's not about a single document anymore. Everyone lives that and carries with them in everywhere we go and any Fedora things that we do. So that is Fedora is my community, so I can call it out. And that is the successful uh, example. Definitely. Came for code and stayed for friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. I came for friends. I came for friends and continue to stay for friends. <laughs> Nita, I just want to thank you all for having, I want to thank you and the rest of the group for having me here today. I've really appreciated the opportunity to learn so much just from listening to all of you about your experiences in the Fedora community. And I hope we can continue these conversations. Uh, it's been wonderful for to be here. And I unfortunately have to leave and go to another meeting, but I really appreciate the time today and wish you a great rest of the conference yeah thank you so much Ruchi, and thank you everybody because this is the unfortunately this is the time to leave for all of us and move on uh, but such amazing comments such amazing inputs incredible discussion i think uh, even if we have not covered all of the questions the gist we have taken with us from this uh, conversation i think that was commendable so thank you so much for being part and being so nice panel <laughs> and hearing with me. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you I'm for having sure. us. Thank you, Amita. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, having this, this happen. Yeah. happen. I sure just wanted to mention one thing. Yeah. This is actually my first panel discussion. So I was really nervous for it. <laughs> you but... did a great job. <laughs> you did great. You did great. Yeah. 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 But uh, thank you. You all made me feel like really comfortable to uh, speak. So yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Justin, are you around? And I'm sure we will again cross path with each other. Yes, for sure. Because we all are at the same space. Justin, how do you think? How did, did it go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought this was a very amazing panel. And I want to say also thank you to all of our panelists and uh, Amita for also helping moderate. This was definitely a highlight session for me. And it was really great to hear from all of you and have, you know, all of us had some connection to the Linux open source, well, specifically the Linux space, not just open source broadly, but we've all got some uh, dipping some toes into the Linux space. It was great to hear all these different perspectives from across still different corners of our of our universe and i don't know i i really enjoy that panel and i really hope that we can continue to do things like this at weco diversity in the future so thank you all to our panelists and thank you amita for being our moderator for today thank you justin thanks a lot for this opportunity and i'm so happy that fedora is continuing doing these amazing things and giving the platform to discuss these crucial issues and very important topics. So thanks a lot. Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you guys okay. Thanks Bye. for having me. All right. So we'll go ahead and move into our closing remarks for today. We'll wait for our team to come on stage. I think Yona, you wanna try to jump on in here?